Hey students, this is Professor Gore. Um, this is the second part of the economic transformation um, recorded lecture. And so this is going to cover four main topics of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Market Revolution, the Transportation Revolution, and the Communications Revolution. So I talked about the Industrial Revolution, the last one, and introduced the Market Revolution, and also covered the, the Communications Revolution briefly, talking about Samuel Morris and the um, Telegraph. Along with the communication revolution, you also have faster mail service across the ocean, especially with the invention of steamships. And also the Pony Express with the telegraph is going to kind of make that obsolete. Um, and then telephones come in the second phase of the Industrial Revolution in the second half of the 1800s. Now, um, one of the things that I want to kind of emphasize as I conclude at the end, we're talking about labor. Um, basically, Labor unions are always pushing for the three things of better pay, better hours, better working conditions. And so they started organizing together to bargain collectively against their employer. Um, and so at times they were successful. Uh, for instance, in, in 1836, nearly 50 strikes occurred to try to accomplish um, some of their goals and so forth. In the textile industry, the output grew past the demand, which caused both prices to drop as well as profits and wages. Employers also imposed more stringent work rules. In 1828, women held a strike in New Hampshire and won some relief. So that was a success. And by the 1850s, many industrial workers were facing the threat of unemployment. As machines produced more goods, the supply of manufacturers exceeded the demand for them and prompted employers to lay off workers. In 1857, overproduction coincided with the financial panic that was sparked by speculative investments in railroad that went bankrupt. The result was a major economic recession right before the American Civil War. Unemployment rose to 10 percent, reminding Americans of the social costs of new and otherwise very successful system of industrial production. So because a lot of this uncertainty and instability and then these bad conditions that, that labor unions formed. All right. So let's go back to the market revolution that that I introduced briefly in, in part one. Um, and so what the market revolution is, is the availability of new goods. Um, that have never been available really to American consumers, but also getting your goods to the market as well to be sold, thereby increasing your own profits and uh, advancement. And so you'll see that the market revolution, the industrial revolution, and the transportation revolution are all intertwined with each other. Um, the transportation revolution helps the market revolution because it, it's able to ship goods cheaper and get it to more markets than ever before. OK, uh, the Industrial Revolution produces new consumer goods that provide uh, in this market revolution. And the Industrial Revolution provides the technology and capability to have the transportation revolution. And then the market revolution helps spur on more industry because of demands there. So they're all inter interlocked and intertwined with each other during this time period. So as American factories and farms turned out more goods, businessmen and legislatures created faster and cheaper ways to get these products to consumers. Beginning in the late 1810s, they constructed a massive system of canals and roads that linked the states along the Atlantic coast with one another and with the new states in the Trans-Appalachian West. This transportation system set in motion both the market revolution and a great migration of people. And by 1860, nearly one third of the nation's citizens lived in the Midwest. The five states carved out of the Northwest Territory, which were Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and then along with Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota where they create a complex society and economy that increasingly resemble the Northeast. Okay. Now, one thing I think it's interesting to talk about is this American system. And so um, Henry Clay pushed for um, renewal of the bank of the United States. Okay. This bank provided the loans for a lot of this infrastructure growth. Okay. That he's pushing for because he's, he's in Kentucky, which is considered a Western state and uh, people in the West wanted better transportation, ship their goods to the market. Also, better transportation to get out west if they want to sell. Um, he also pushed for uh, tariffs to protect American industry um, and then federal government infrastructure projects. So um, John Calhoun, who was a Southerner from South Carolina, who they were allied originally for the War of 1812 as a war hawk, he's opposed to this because he feels like it doesn't benefit the South. And so he's kind of being selfish about this. He doesn't like tariffs. Um, he saw tariffs basically is hindering the South economically, which it did make things more expensive in the South because um, instead of getting the cheapest British goods, they had to 
usually the American goods were the cheapest, but were still more expensive than the British goods would have been without the tariff. Um, and so that's a conflict politically. And so um, anyway, the only federal government infrastructure project done before the Civil War is the National Road. Um, now, there's a lot of infrastructure projects that are done, but they're financed by states um, and they're also find that financed by banks, particularly B British banks really got involved in the American economy. In fact, we were the United States was kind of debtors really until World War One to uh, a lot of British banks um, because they funded a lot of the, uh, you know, industrial um, buildings and infrastructure projects and so forth. So anyway, um, hoping one of the things Henry Clay was hoping for is that with this American system, the three sections of the country worked together to build the country. So let me show you this. Um, so in the Northeast, they're, um, one of their main government leaders is a guy by the name of Daniel Webster. Okay. And they're the kind of the business and manufacturing center of the, the country. Uh, they wanted tariffs because they wanted their, their goods protected. They wanted internal improvements, okay, because it got allowed cheaper goods to get to the factories. But they wanted to end to cheap public land. You know why? Because the northeastern states were losing people to the west, and they were losing political power with with uh, members in the House of Representatives. Um, they are nationalistic. They are against slavery, and typically where you had the greatest numbers of abolitionists. Doesn't mean everybody in New England was abolitionists, but a lot more were. Now, in the South, their kind of political leader was John Cahoon, knows others, but he's kind of most well-known. Um, big on cotton growing, um, some food crops as well, um, but, but cotton is going to be the big cash crop in the South. It was tobacco, and tobacco still made money, but, but not like cotton did. Um, and so slavery, slaves kept getting sent down to the Deep South. They didn't like tariffs because they wanted goods as cheap as possible, whether if they're coming from Britain or, or from American factories. Um, they didn't like government spending on the American system. Um, they're all about states' rights, which uh, the Civil War um, is one of the causes of the Civil War, and they're pro-slavery. Now, in the West, you had a variety of states that were in the West, but Henry Clay was kind of their spokesperson in Congress. They are all about internal improvements. The Western states provide a lot of the uh, farming um, that feed the industrial workers in the Northeast um, and also provided some food crops for the South. South had their own food crops, but the Midwest exported a ton of food crops. Um, and they um, also want a cheap land because they want to be able to settle out there. And a lot of them were against slavery, although Henry Clay was actually a slave owner himself. Um, but they they um, were okay with people deciding if they wanted slavery, it was called popular sovereignty. Now, because of economic ties, the Midwest and Northeast became far closer economically because the Midwest provided the food to feed the industrial workers. And the Northeast provided the industrial goods, particularly farm equipment that helped the Midwest. And that's why they became interconnected. Plus, the way the rivers flow and so forth, and the way that, and particularly when canals were constructed, they became more connected transportation wise as well. And so the South shipped cotton up to the North via railroads, uh, steamboats originally, um, and still some steamboats, but as railroads start taking off in the late 1840s, really 1850s, the decade before the American Civil War, that's when they start doing that. Um, and so rivers connected a lot of the South to um, the Midwest, and then you could go to the ocean to the Northeast and so forth. All right, so we've talked about the uh, American system. Um, one of the things, internal improvements, not funded by the federal government, funded by a New York Governor DeWitt Clinton. Great idea because it really benefits New York's economy as well as almost any, probably as well as any infrastructure project in American history. Um, and it was dug primarily by Irish. And um, it took about eight years, give or take, to, to connect Lake Erie to the Hudson River. So it starts at Buffalo, which is why Buffalo is a big city. And it goes just north of Albany on the, to the Hudson River. My parents have been on it just a few weeks ago from the, when I made, when I'm making this lecture. Um, so you look right here, Buffalo, not too far from Niagara Falls, which is where my parents went, um, all the way to Troy, which is, there's a university there. Um, also there's a, one in, in uh, Alabama as well. And then you've got Al Albany, which is the capital of New York. And you can see actually it, outside of, of New York city metropolis, um, 
I want to say it's like 50% of the upper state New York population lives within 25 miles of the Erie Canal today. It's pretty fascinating. All right. So the Erie Canal getting built was such an economic success. They built others. They built one in Pennsylvania, one in Maryland, Ohio, Indiana, and so forth, because it was very successful. Um, and then one of the things that happens as well is they began connecting railroads to these canals. Um, and so it really brought the new availability of goods. It brought people It lowered transportation costs. It basically, if you want to put it in modern day terms, it makes UPS, FedEx, U.S. Postal Service and DHL much cheaper. This is an example of a, of a canal. Um, also, um, the government provided surveys for railroads, but they didn't really like build railroads and or help fund railroads until after the Civil War. And when, when that happens, that, that's a big deal. Um, now, there are steamships that uh, develop after the steamboat that to go on ocean travel. The problem is, is they were slow. Um, so they, they still use these sailing vessels that were tall, really skinny. They were called clipper ships and they could they could go right cut through the water very quickly. And you would think that the clipper ships, because of faster transportation, would kind of one up steamships. But steamships, because they were primitive, end up um, being the, the vessel of choice, even though it went slower, because they were wider and they could hold more cargo. So you could fit more stuff on there to ship. And uh, this is what a river steamboat looked like in the top left. It's a, a drawing of one. Uh, you may have seen this portrayed in a movie. Ever seen the movie Maverick with Mel Gibson or, or any of those? Uh, Jodie Foster's in that. And then the clipper ship is the one on the right. It's tall and skinny. So one of the things is that the West is always going to be played by bad, muddy roads. So the National Road was made with crushed gravel. Connects them. I mean, you look at one of the major cities, boom, Indianapolis, right there on the National Road, which made it uh, prosperous. This is what it would have looked like with the crushed gravel. And this is the uh, uh, transportation method of choice, the Conestoga wagon. And then you can see right here from this map, this is showing in green the canals. And there they have little lines to uh, just on one side of them. And then the uh, navigable rivers are kind of bolded in blue. And the ones that aren't navigable are really skinny. And then um, it also showed you roads that were built. And so one of the ways that they funded these roads is they would get investors to invest in it. And then how they would pay those investors back is they would charge uh, tolls. So they were a turnpike, okay? kind of like the George Bush or turnpike in, in the Dallas Worth Metroplex or 121 or um, and others. Now, the railroad revolution really took off in the 1850s and especially is going to shoot off right, um, right after the uh, Civil War in the late 1860s, 1870s, until kind of a railroad bubble burst. But it still continues to get built. I mean, at one point in the late 1800s, uh, the United States laid more rail track than all of Europe combined. It was crazy. In the 1850s when it gets started. Um, and so the Transcontinental Railroad is not completed until 1869. starts really in 1865. But you can see right here. These are railroads. You'd notice the Midwest is full of them, as well as the Northeast. And then um, you look at the South, it's lacking. And then, of course, a lot of them get destroyed during the American Civil War. Uh, I do have to tell you a fascinating story about Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, because I think this is risky, but it paid off huge dividends. Um, he actually got started in the steamboat industry by... Um, kind of gambling and, and winning a boxing match to get his first fall, small steamboat on a river. And he was able to make that so profitable, he was able to buy others. And eventually he became the largest steamboat uh, company owner in the U.S. And then at his height, economically, he sold it all and got into the railroad business. And he became the most well-known railroad tycoon in American history. Um, few people would have had that, that foresight and risk to sell when you're at the top of your game to something, to another venture that even put him even greater um, at his game than what he was before. And so uh, the railroads are going to be the greatest transportation innovation of the 1800s. Okay. Now steamboats are great. Canals are great, but the railroads in terms of importance from the 1850s all the way to the turn of the century, it is the greatest transportation innovation in American history. Um, now later it's going to be cars like that in the 20th century. 
okay, the internal combustion engine. Um, now, a lot of canal backers economically didn't want railroads because they felt threatened. Uh, there was a danger of fire because the um, the original engines were, were a, little, a little more dangerous than uh, they are in later designs. Their brakes were terrible um, until uh, George Westinghouse invented the Westinghouse steam brake. Um, it used steam pressure to, to break, but oftentimes when a train would, would come into a station, it would either stop too soon or stop too far and have to back up. And so um, one thing too, that was really confusing is they had different widths of tracks. And so you had to have different cars and different uh, engines on different, different tracks. Eventually Cornelius Vanderbilt and, and others back a standard gauge. And that's the, the general width of, of tracks today. You can see from these maps, all these different rail lines. I mean, it really is incredible how many rail lines that we, we have built in court. All this costs money. States would typically give the, the railroad company land to sell, and that's how they would fund the construction. Also, you had good old-fashioned investment banking, and you had a lot of uh, British foreign investment banking that did this as well. So um, one of the things is the Pony Express connected east and west. It lasted only a couple of years because really telegraphs kind of um, once they start laying, uh, putting telegraph lines along the Transcontinental Railroad, it kind of makes it obsolete. Um, but uh, one of the things, too, that are we had such a uh, with capitalism in the economy, it allowed entrepreneurial growth. Um, I know we'll, we'll talk about particularly in the first module of U.S. History two, the negative effects sometimes of capitalism and the abuse. But, man, the, the positives far outweigh the negatives. If you look at the 1800s in American history, with with how much economic opportunity it provided for so many Americans, um, you know, and, and even it improved the lives of even a lot of the poor people as a result of the market revolution. And and especially if you want to travel out west to, to get available land, you had to, you, you had to be able to do that at separate, such a cheaper rate than you would have beforehand. And then also this transportation revolution kind of increased nationalism and a unif unifying movement. Unfortunately, it doesn't last because of slavery and the American Civil War. All right. And we will get to the growth of cities and towns in part three of the economic and transformation recorded lecture.